Welcome back to the In The Blues Tone podcast. It's now February 24, 2018. No, it's 2019. Damn it. <laughs> Why it takes me till like June to get that right. Why do I keep doing that? Anyway, it's all good. We're leaving it in. That's, that's the way I like to roll on these podcasts. We make a mistake, we keep moving forward. So this particular podcast is sponsored by, well, nobody yet again as well. So if you'd like to help support the channel, I'll tell you what, I'll leave a link up here to Teesprings. I've designed a new t-shirt. It says, I'd rather be playing the blues. It looks pretty cool. It'll be up in the cards if you're on a device that supports that. Otherwise, I'll leave a link in the description below. So I'm plugging my own stuff, but I don't do it very often. So thank you so much. All right, today we're going to go over a number of different uh, topics, including EHX Suing Mua. I'm going to talk about some of the different things I've had a chance to try and a couple of follow-up discussions on things that I purchased that I definitely want to go back over and things that I was sent as well and what my thoughts are about them now after the fact as well. I think it's always good doing a follow-up video after a month, after a few weeks, after you've had a chance to play and use these items live as well. That's one of those things I don't see a lot of channels doing. They'll buy something, they'll put on their wall, they don't actually take it out and play it live. So my focus will be moving forward a lot more is to take a lot of the stuff I get sent out and film something live at a jam or at a gig. I've had a chance to do that with a number of different things recently as well. And the first one I think I'm going to start with here is the Artist Tweed Tone 20 amplifier. Now this is an amplifier very similar, I guess, to a Blues Junior or Classic, Classic 30 from PV. It's rated at 20 watts. If you missed the video, I'll leave a link up in the cards as well. Basically, this amp totally blew me away. It's my now my favorite jam amplifier, and I'll tell you why. It's light, it's extremely loud. It's supposedly rated at 20 watts. It feels more like 30. I know there's not gonna be a huge difference between 20 and 30 watts, but it's a headroom thing. It feels big, it feels, it fills the room, as in fills, F-I-L-L-S, not feels with ease. But it fills the room no problems at all it has really great projection really great 3d sound uh yeah like i said it's light you can chuck it in the car it's easy to carry it, it does way more than i was anticipating the amp would do so uh, moving forward if anyone says hey should i buy if I'm, if you're in australia or a country that supports uh, or has an artist guitar shop what should i buy this this or this odds are i'm gonna say if the artist tweet tones in that discussion i'm gonna say that I just think it's a much better sounding amp than both the Classic 30, which I really like that amp as well, and the Blues Junior, which I've owned a couple of over the years as well. Uh, I'm blown away by it. I would say I get just as great of a tone out of my Marshall DSL 40 as I do the Artist Tweed Tone. They're a different sound, but they're just as easy to get a really great live sound out of. I've taken the Artist Tweed Tone and played it live maybe three or four times now at a gig, at a couple of jam nights, and it just absolutely totally rocked. I loved it. I'll show you some, I already posted a clip with some footage as well. I might add some to this particular section, just a few seconds or something like that, but overall it's a great amp. Now one small limitation of it is the fact that it doesn't sound as great when you turn it down lower. So uh, like most valve amps, crank them up, you'll get a much better sound and you'll have a sound that easily will, will do small to medium gigs, no problems at all. I'm playing tonight, I'm gonna take it up again. I really enjoy it. In the first couple of weeks of owning the Artist Tweed Tone, I actually replaced the speaker with an Eminence Texas Heat just to see if it would add more volume and add a little bit more vibe than the stock 7080 Celestion. Now, for those of you who don't know, might be watching this for the first time or new to the channel, I'm not a huge fan of 7080 speakers. I think they're the Achilles heel in a lot of other amplifiers I've tried. In the Artist Tweed Tone, it sounded better than the Texas Heat. It sounded very different. It had, it sort of has a mid sound that works extremely well for that tweed type of sound, you know, where the, the amp sounds like it's just, I don't know, it's pushing a lot of mids and it's getting a little gnarly. It really works well. Having the American voice speaker in there was okay, but it did, it just lost a little bit too much tops for my ear. Now, if I was to put a, sp a speaker in that, I'd probably try the Tonka, which I've actually got in my Marshall right now. I think that's a very sort of safe and generic and very loud speaker that would work extremely well in something like the Artist Tweed Tone. So for my money, the Swamp Thing would be a great speaker as well. Just inherently, I think having a little bit of extra tops like that uh, and, and bottoms and a really efficient speaker would be a really great choice for the Artist Tweed Tone. But as it stands right now, the 7080 is staying in there until I get my hands on something else that might work well in it. But as of right now, Artist Tweed Tone, all stock. I would take it over the Blues Junior in a live situation. 
No questions about it, and I've owned a Blues Junior, and I would also take it over a Classic 30. I think it actually feels way louder and has more gain in the Classic 30 as well. So food for thought. So a couple of weeks back, I did a Music Gear on a Budget episode where I was talking about these. These are some rubber strap locks, and they're just called safety locks. They, they just look like that. I don't know if my camera is going to focus. Yep, there we go. So I did a video on these, and I said I'd do a follow-up once I had a chance to use them and to see how reliable they are. They're awesome. I have no problems with these at all. Uh, they've replaced all of the XTR strap locks. One of my little crow guitars also has uh, shallow uh, strap locks on them, so I don't need to change that. But in terms of all of my other guitars, except for the two that I haven't replaced just yet, they're all gonna be with these now. These work extremely well. They're about 50 cents each. I posted links in the description of that video as well. And a few people said they tried them and they enjoyed them. So I'll leave a link below if you're interested in checking them out. I got these off eBay in Australia. You can essentially buy these from anywhere. For 50 cents, they're the best investment you could make. And you know, if you lose one or one breaks or you, you misplace it, who cares? <laughs> they're cheap enough that it doesn't matter. One of the interesting things about these, right, is the fact that they're pliable sideways. So you can kind of bend them like edge to edge, but you cannot pull them apart this way like pulling them against the the circle in the middle is actually pretty tough uh, these have been extremely reliable now you can take them off easy if you grab the strap and you just pull away from the body they'll, they'll come off but if you're just playing like you would any old time and you've got the guitar on I, i've done three hour gigs with these and had no issues so they've replaced every anytime you see any of my guitars in videos unless there's no strap locks on them because i'm using like a dodgy strap that for whatever reason Odds are you're going to see these on all of my guitars. I think these are great. I used to use the plastic ones that have those little uh, bits you can sort of slide sideways. I've still got those. They're a good little backup. These are much better. No moving parts means they don't break. I've had a few of those other ones sort of come apart uh, over the years as well. And I mean, for what you pay for those plastic ones, they work really well. But overall, these safety locks are awesome. I thought I'd do a follow-up video just letting you know that I didn't buy a dud. <laughs> And I wanted to share that because sometimes stuff sent out or I buy things and if I don't do a follow-up and I go oh man I had problems with these I want to let people know so when I did that initial XTR strap lock video I was really impressed by the value of them only to find out they weren't very reliable so overall check out these safety locks I'll leave some links below if you're interested but uh, for 50 cents man or thereabouts how can you go wrong and they also have I'm pretty sure a lot of guys were saying they bought Fender ones instead of these. These are just, you know, generic black ones like this. And yeah, they definitely do the business. So one of the most interesting things I probably had a chance to showcase on the channel was that deflex piece of Perspex that you put in front of your guitar amplifier as a diffuser, which essentially stops the blizzard of nails. I borrowed that off one of my friends, Wayne. They were 500 Australian dollars. That's right, I sort of hinted at that at the end, or maybe I said it in the description or something, but they're 500 bucks, right? So they're not cheap. I think a few people might've been under, maybe I didn't explain myself properly exactly what was going on with those and what the idea was behind it. So a lot of people were commenting saying, hey, the diffuser doesn't reduce the volume at all. That's correct, it's not supposed to. So it's supposed to stay just as loud, but it's knocking out that top end. And another comment was, wow, it really doesn't, the tone completely changes and you lose basically the overall tone of the amp. And it, you're right, it does knock out the tops and that's also what it's trying to do. So essentially, let, I'll try and explain it the best I can. So if you've got your amplifier sitting here, that's your amp and people are right in front of it, everyone's gonna get killed that are sitting right in front of it, right? And odds are you as a guitar player maybe standing next to it, won't hear what they're hearing, right? So having the, the baffle in front of the amplifier, throwing the sound back up at your ear, you're still gonna hear your tone. It's just the people that are in front of it aren't gonna cop that blizzard of nails. Now, a lot of people were also saying, oh, if the tone changes uh, and it doesn't sound as good, people aren't gonna hear the right tone. And you that's absolutely right. It, it does change your tone, but if you're playing at a gig where you're mic'd up and the microphone's on the inside of that unit, then you're still gonna have the same sound going into the PA system. So I, I don't know if I explained that properly. What you were hearing was the microphone in three different positions and notice it didn't sound any different in either three of those positions and the amp was still in the same spot, right? So 
that's the cool thing about that unit. And supposedly, it's one of the things that it claims to do, and it does, is make the sound more consistent anywhere you stand in the room if you're in front of the amp. And if you're behind it, you get more of the side spill now. You're going to hear more tops if you're you know, beside the amplifier as you would just having all the top end shooting out the front. So that's what it's going for. I maybe not, I maybe didn't explain it as well as I could have in the actual video, but I was pressed for time when I shot that as well. I wanted to spend a little bit more time with it, but I only had it for a few days and I wanted to make sure I got it back. But yeah, it's an interesting unit and what it does, it does extremely well. I like the fact it doesn't actually cut your volume down. So if you're loud, it's still gonna st stay really loud. And I think the best example of this is if your amp's right on a stage and people are eating dinner right at the end of the stage, sitting down, they're gonna cop that blizzard of nails. What this will do is make it way more pleasing for them. Sure, it's gonna change your sound, but the trade-off is people won't complain. <laughs> Once you knock that top end out, for the audience at least, uh, who might be right in that blizzard of nails area, uh, they're gonna be a lot more happy with the, with the gig. Now, if you're playing at a small gig, I think it would be almost a no-brainer to have one of these things um, to some extent, you know, like like I said in the video, you could just turn your amplifier around, but it, it's one of those things, for what it does, it does extremely well. Are they overpriced? Absolutely, they're way too expensive. I wouldn't spend 500 bucks on one. Sorry, Wayne, I, I think they're, they work, but they're way too expensive. So that's my thoughts on it. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. Recently, I came across a speaker that I had no expectations of and it totally blew me away. Now, I'm not sponsored by any speaker company. Every eminent speaker I own, I've purchased or I bought off a friend or something like that. So none of these were free and neither was this one. I don't even own it, right? But my friend Brian has, a, basically it's kind of like a, a blues deluxe amplifier clone. It's that kind of thing. It's a one channel version of that basically. So it's around 30 or 40 watts. Uh, loaded with a 12-inch speaker. He ripped out the stock speaker and Brian's more of a speaker aficionado than I am. I, he, he's got, you know, they pile up at his house. It's it's quite humorous. But uh, yeah, he has a red, white, and blue speaker in there. Wow, man, that speaker is a beast. It's kind of like the best combination of a Swamp Thing mixed with a Texas Heat. Now, what it does do in comparison to the Texas Heat, it has more top end. It also has this 3D pro projection I really like. It might not have quite have a, has a low end sound as the Swamp Thing, but it's a tight sort of punchy sound that works extremely well. Now this speaker would work well in the majority of Fender amps without losing the character of those amps as well. That's, uh, you know what, if I'm, I think one day I'd like to try to, I might buy one and see how it goes in my Blues Deluxe because I think it would be a really great match for that amp as well. I've had the Swamp Thing in there now for so long, and I actually tried the, the Texas Heat in my Blues Deluxe as well, and it was great, but I put that back, well, it's gonna go back in the Bandit pretty soon. I just got it back. But Brian borrowed my Texas Heat, and he's got the red, white, and blues, and he said to me, I'm gonna stick with the red, red white, and blues. So there you go. It might be one of the, the best undiscovered speakers. So I can't wait to, I'm gonna see if I can borrow one off him. He's probably got a couple of them. If not, I'll go out and buy one. I'll do some tests as well because this might be the speaker that uh, does the business for a lot of people. You know, there's a, some guys that feel like a Texas Heat takes out a little bit too much top end. And I, I'm like that in certain amps. You know, if you've got a solid state amplifier or a modeling amp, Texas Heat's great. It adds more oomph, uh, sort of shaves out that, maybe that ice pick top end if you do get some of those artifacts coming through in your sound. That's why I like it in stuff like the PV, the Fender Mustang amps and all that kind of stuff. But the red, white, and blues just felt great to play. It had this awesome projection of sound. It sounded very balanced. It actually had a lot of growl to it. And these are terms that might not make a lot of sense if you don't play live or you're not up with the differences in speakers. But the best way to improve your amplifier sound, other than playing better, <laughs> is to change the speaker. It makes a massive difference. I've proved this time and time again. So on my radar now is the red, white, and blues from Eminence. We might have to see what happens with that. <laughs> if you've had a chance to use one, let me know in the comments if you already own one and you swapped it out for a different speaker. Let everybody know in the comments which speaker you had and what and what your thoughts are on swapping out to the red, white, and blues. I think they're really, really nice. So uh, yeah, let me know your thoughts. 
So one of the things I always try and do is up the ante on my videos every single year or as often as I can when things become available. So Guitar Search Saturdays is back. What you're seeing is the last of the videos we shot while we're in Germany. So there's two more to come. They're all handheld videos done with, I think my GH5 was the camera that I had with me, which is what I'm shooting with right now. And that's got a great stabilizer in there, right? So the only way to make the videos even better is to probably make them more stable. Now yeah, there's editing things I could probably do as well, but I'm trying my best, right? And people love those videos and thank you so much for all the support with them as well. It's great once they're done. You know, there's such a big project to do. And what I've started doing now is making less videos during the week so I can actually do Guitar Search Saturday and have time for it. One of the things I was finding was the fact I would have so many other things come into the into the house here that I would need to film or, or would try to film, I'd always keep pushing Guitar Search Saturdays back, which made no sense because overall, in terms of like retention rate, which means how much of the video people watch and overall watch time, the Guitar Search Saturday playlist is like 400% higher than everything else, right? So I'm gonna start working more towards the strengths with those videos and keep making them better as well. And that's the plan. So one of the things I have is this i might have showcased a gimbal about i don't know six months ago on the channel i ended up taking it back a few days after i purchased it because it didn't work and i ended up with this now this has got a little bit of a, a band around here velcro thing right now but and for those who can't see it i apologize but this is the dji ronin s gimbal these are one of the best gimbals you can get for the price uh, no doubt about it essentially the camera goes on top of this uh, once it's hooked up it's got three motorized uh, sections to it like uh, gears basically that will then allow you to keep the camera as stable as you like now i've already shot with this a couple of times i did a cinematic sort of beach shot the night i got it and i was totally blown away i might show you a few seconds of that coming up in just a moment and i also filmed josh lenardowitz who is australia's number one bodybuilder and who will be in the top five hopefully this year as well in the world so um, I got a chance to t test this out in a couple of different situations and it worked great. So as of right now, the rest of the Germany uh, episodes of Guitar Search Saturday will all be shot handheld, or they have been. Uh, anything else I shoot in Australia, I will be using this. Now, this isn't something I think that's too practical to travel with, to be honest. It's actually quite large and it's, it's heavier than it might look as well. You can detach it and break it down and make it small for travel but it's still you know two or three kilos it's somewhere around you know i don't know about six pounds or something like that so it does weigh quite a bit and once you get the camera on there as well it's quite heavy but i'm not 100 percent certain if i'll travel with this overseas or not um, i do plan on going away at some point this year it's my 40th birthday coming up and i want to do something fun and memorable for that so odds are i'll go somewhere cool and look if i can take it i will but i want to make sure i'm not uh, sort of packing too heavy when I travel. I don't like doing that either. But the, I mean, the stabilizer in the GH5 is fantastic. So either way, there'll be more episodes coming up. I, if I go to Sydney or if I go to Queensland or something like that and do some episodes in a different state here in Australia, I'll have this with me. That makes it a whole lot easier. And that's something I plan on doing this year as well. I'd like to organize maybe two or three shops in different states where I can just go and do it and do it up to the standard I'm happy with and have this. So if you've ever watched like a home improvement show of any description, you see a lot of the cameras sort of pan up and pan down. They look really smooth when they're walking, all that kind of stuff. They've got something very similar to this. Um, some of the professionals were using like a harness uh, and, and like a dual handle one, but uh, this essentially is arguably the best of the, you know, the, the single hand, they call it the single handed gimbals, but it is a two handed job. You know, you got some controls on the back, you can move things around, make the motors move, all that kind of stuff. So what's the point of this? The point is Guitar Search Saturday will be looking even better, hopefully coming up in the near future. And this allows me to get up higher too, because I'm not, you know, I'm not restricted by my own arm reach now. I've got this. So I can essentially reach up over a foot and a bit higher than I'd be able to normally, which is fantastic. So this was possible thanks to the guys that support the Patreon page. This was a couple of months of that money just get, getting put aside and reinvesting it into the channel. So thank you so much. I want to give everybody on Patreon a huge shout out for making this possible. And this is something that will get used on the channel, not just for Guitar Search Saturdays, but if I go maybe to the Melbourne Guitar Show or some sort of thing like that in the, again in the future, 
I'll have this with me and the footage will just look so much better. I can use it if I interview somebody or if we do another one of those live jams, which I, I, I really want to do. I thought we'd have another one done by now, but we haven't. This will be the perfect thing to get the interview footage just stable and and what more watchable. And that's what it's all about. So thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll see how this goes on future episodes. Up next, we have a little bit of news. I don't know if a lot of people have been talking about this or not, but I thought it was definitely worth pointing out because I think something like this might be the first of many more things like it to come. And this was something I was pretty unaware of, but when it happened, I got lots and lots of messages from people. So thank you so much for sh uh, sharing this. If I had have done a podcast last month, I would have mentioned it, but I didn't. So I'm just gonna go over this and then give you my thoughts. So Electro Harmonics actually sued Mua and Electro Harmonics won. So they hired some Chinese based lawyers to go after Mua for blatantly copying some of their software and releasing pedals with exactly the same software code and copyright disclaimer code still in the code of their pedals that they were selling right so they essentially just stole software and resold it allegedly um, but obviously that's what exactly happened because electro harmonics were then uh, granted a six-figure number now I don't know how much that was but I'll read you a little bit of this and I'll leave a link in the description this is from ehx.com and it's called Chinese pirates of electro harmonic software walks the plank that says, uh, Shenzhen Mua Audio Company Limited, a Chinese manufacturer and marketer of electro electronic pedals, was flagrantly infringing on EHX's copyrighted software. Two of Mua's effects pedals, an organ simulated na named the Muagan and an octave pedal called the Tender Octava, included exact copies of compiled software contained in EHX's C9 organ machine and micro pog pedals exact copy <laughs> exact copies all right so let's go over to the next section it says the infringement was so bold and blatant that shenzhen's mua audaciously copied ehx's copyright notice in the software powering the c9 and micro pog after becoming aware of the piracy electro harmonics retained counsel and aggressively uh, sought recourse uh, i don't blame them you know it's one thing and this is the thing that i've always said it's one thing to take inspiration from a pedal and make it different or put your own spin on it or something like that at least you're doing something a little bit more creative but making a uh, stealing uh, software code isn't cool like that's illegal in every country in the world i'm pretty sure so uh yeah i, I don't know if these pedals are still on the market odds are they're probably not but uh, if you maybe they'll be collector's items at one point. EHX's president Mike uh, Matthews State Electro Harmonics has successfully won battles with labor racketeers in the USA, ruthless mobsters in and ruthless mobsters in Russia. After almost two years of fighting, the Chinese courts have awarded EHX a nearly six-figure judgment. Our victory is now complete. These pirates have walked the plank. Uh, this is a really there's some pretty funny photos. I'll see if I can post them on screen or something like that as well on here. But uh, yeah, I'll definitely post a link in the description. You can check it out. So it's really surprising that this sort of stuff doesn't happen more. There's so many pedals that are copies of copies of copies. You know, they just, there's so many companies that put their own spin on stuff as well, which I like. But um, I know a lot of people say, oh, you can't patent a circuit and all that kind of stuff. Begs the question of why, you know, <laughs> like if you've got a specific sort of design, it would be, I don't know, I, there needs to be maybe some sort of recourse for that. Maybe it'll stop more of the piracy. I, I'm not really too sure. Or the blatant copies. I, like I said, if you didn't rebox something and if yeah, if Mua had have basically tried to make their version of that pedal with their own software and all that, fine. You know, like that's at least doing something different and won't sound exactly the same. But it's interesting when you see uh, people like this copy software just straight over to their own stuff. And I've seen this in one other industry. I buy a lot of plugins, all these little things you see slide in and out and all that kind of stuff on my videos. There's a company that does exactly the same thing. They take a new release from somebody else and repackage it and sell it. They might remove the code that says who created it, but it's pretty nasty and odds are they're gonna get sued like nobody's business coming up pretty soon. Now, I don't su actively support those companies, but I'm just using that as an example. This has been well documented that uh, motion VFX software has been copied by a lot of people and they make the best plugins for you know doing video editing, in my opinion, it's all subjective stuff, but there's a lot of companies out there that will uh, take 
take code from other people which is highly illegal and redistribute it or resell it which which sucks but the fact that Moore did this with basically just copying the software <laughs> copy paste done that, that's not cool now I've demoed a lot of uh, Moore's stuff over the years as well none of them have been direct copies like that and if they were I would have I would have taken the videos down that you know obviously they've got pedals that are heavily inspired from from other pedals and they might sound even the same but they're different they're physically different they don't have the software if that was if I had one of those videos up I would have taken it down so yeah let me know what you think of this this is maybe something a push in the right direction possibly for for companies not to be doing the wrong thing let me know if you think this will destroy Moore or whether they'll keep going or whether you think they have the resources to keep going after something like this as well uh hats off to ehx for following this up and and you know claiming what was theirs i think that's a that's really good and it's i'm actually pretty pleased that a company like electroharmonics is sort of you know this is the funny thing too before i say that th this is the whole thing uh, Moore have copied blatantly copied the design or uh, the, the software right but and that's a different thing to copying the design of something but ehx have also made lots of pedals based on other pedals i mean look at the soul foods clon they sound indistinguishable right so it's an interesting sort of dynamic that you can do that obviously there's a lot of soft right uh software copyright laws too uh which i don't know the extent of but i worked in it long enough to know you don't go doing that <laughs> right so yeah it's interesting that you can do that you can copy a pedal but the software is overstepping the line and yeah i don't know let me know what you think of this it's kind of it's kind of interesting I, I was pretty shocked when i actually read this article and like i said i'll link it below let me know your thoughts over to one of my favorite things that I like to cover on the podcast, and that's the polls. Polls are always good fun. I like to know what people are thinking and how they feel about a certain topic. Now, I list these usually in the cards, which pop up up here, and I also run them on my feed as well. But we're going to cover some of the ones that you've seen pop up in videos over the last couple of months. So the first one is, should I use cheaper amplifiers for inexpensive guitars? 55% of people said yes. 25% of people said, I don't mind either way and no got 18 percent so essentially most people are in favor of say i get harley benton guitars in or something like that you want to hear it with a less expensive amp maybe the pv bandit maybe now the artist tweet tone 20r something like that as opposed to you know going through my marshall dsl or one of my fender amps or something like that so that makes sense i get it and i'm going to be doing that more and more coming up i actually did that i think on the last video i did of this artist guitar back here i actually used uh, a less expensive amplifier. I think I used the PV Bandit for the lead tones and it was rocking. So, or I'm gonna use the Kemper, but with the profiles of those less expensive amplifiers. So keep that in mind. That's the way I'm gonna do it coming up. I might not do it on 100% of the videos because sometimes I'm just in a mood for, man, I wanna hear that red channel on the Marshall. And you can only get that out of it, but I'm definitely gonna make more of an effort not to use my most expensive stuff with those kind of uh, guitars. And that, that totally makes sense. One of the polls I ran on a guitar search Saturday, it was episode 31, I think it was the Copenhagen one or maybe the one in uh, Sweden, was do you like one pickup guitars? So just a single pickup guitar of any description, Les Paul Jr., something like that. 58% of people said yes. I've never tried one, got 37% of the votes. So that was surprising actually. 37% of people have never tried one pickup guitar and no got 4%. So there's a huge... Uh, amount of love I guess for a one pickup guitar and I found that to be quite interesting I, I like them too I think if they're done right they're great so uh, I've never tried one 37% go try one I, I definitely think um, you should give that a go all right so the next one that I did was this was on a test I did where I took a PV studio pro 112 and I bypassed the, the EQ stack, I think it was. I went through the effects loop actually, and I used a valve pedal, like uh, it was the the FU uh, pedal that, anyway, I'll put a link somewhere if you haven't seen it. Basically to see if we could turn a solid state amp more into a, a valve sounding amplifier just by using a, a valve pedal in the effects loop. So the question was, which sounds better at Unity, pedal on or pedal off? Pedal on? got 75% of the votes, pedal off got 14% and 
and I can't hear a difference got 10%. So 75% of the people liked or preferred the solid state amplifier with the preamp of the actual, the valve preamp going into it. And unity just means at the same volume. That's all that means. So I did a test where I had the amplifier set up with exactly the same volume, pedal on and pedal off without any volume increase or decrease. Pedal on one by 75%. I actually liked it better as well. It just sounded nicer. What can I tell you? So yeah, it was an interesting test that one, no doubt about it. This next poll was run on another Guitar Search Saturday. This was episode 29. And I asked the question, which do you like the best? A gold top Les Paul, a matte black finish Les Paul, or gimme both? <laughs> which is always the one that you'd think would win, right? So gold top Les Paul got 49% of the votes. So nearly 50% of everybody wanted the gold top. The matte black Les Paul, which I think looked awesome in that video, got 39% of the votes, which is actually quite close as well. It's only 10% behind. And the rest of the votes, the 11%, went to gimme both. So uh, yeah, just a, something a little bit different. That was one of the first times I had a chance to see a matte black Les Paul like that. And it has a very similar kind of finish in terms of its non-gloss to the gold top. It's got that sort of same kind of look, but it's black. I think it looked great. Uh, it, it's definitely cool. If I can find some photos, I'll overlay them on screen as well. One of the most recent polls I ran was about a week ago, and that was for the Deflex sound diffuser, which I was talking about earlier in the podcast. So. I put a poll up. I said, do you like the idea of this? <laughs> I'm not sure. Got 50% of the votes. Yes, got 25% and no, got 25%. And this is exactly why I wanted to re-explain a little bit about the Deflex on the podcast because I feel like I'm not sure getting 50% of the votes means I probably didn't explain what was going on in its entirety or clearly or something like that. But it's an interesting thing. I think once you once you use one and, and try one, then you'll see exactly what it's doing. I, I still think they're, they're really overpriced, but they're pretty cool. This year was the first time I've asked this question publicly on my feed and we got over 1000 votes. So thank you so much. We had so many comments on this particular poll as well. And with a thousand responses, this is a pretty good sample size. So I asked, who's looking forward to the hundreds of NAM videos this week? Uh, do you like that sort of content? And then in brackets, no, I'm not going. Yes, I love NAM content, got 51% of the views. I was really shocked by this. Uh, I, I didn't think it'd be that high, to be honest, just due to the, the amount of those type of videos you see. Uh, going across all of the channels. I thought it would be too much for most people, but obviously not. 51% of people are, are into it. I, I, the second option was I'll watch a few videos, but eh, got 40%. So some people will watch a couple of videos if they're interested in that specific thing, but no one's going to sit there and watch them all. That's pretty what, much what that's telling me. And no, there's too much of a got 10%. So I was really shocked by this. Having a sample size of 1,000 people or 1,100 or whatever it was vote on this was enough to say there's still a lot of interest in NAM videos. Uh, there's I, I don't really have a lot of interest in shooting them, but I watched a few. Unfortunately, though, this year, Tone King didn't go, you know. I, I know he was posting videos of Nam, but he wasn't there. I really like his interviews. I think he's one of the best at them. I followed a little bit of Nam on Instagram, and I'm in the blues with an underscore at the end. If you're not following me on Instagram, you can. That was enough for me. I didn't really feel the need to go through the videos on YouTube. Maybe because I make content, it's different for me, and I'm around gear a lot. I just wasn't interested in... in I was interested in maybe interviews, but I wasn't that interested in gear. This brings me to a topic that I think is really relevant. Stop waiting for next year's stuff to come out and enjoy playing guitar. Work on your chops. Use what you've got and make it work. Next year's Gibsons, well, maybe they'll be better. Maybe they'll be better. And we can say that every single year until the end of time. Use what you've got. Stop blowing money on stuff you don't need. Just my two cents, I really think that I'm not that excited by any new release from Fender or Gibson anymore. I just couldn't care less. I really think the, the guitars you already own or I already own are going to be fine for me to go out and spend thousands of dollars on something just to buy another one of something I already have isn't justified. Any guitar you see me actually purchase will be something completely different to something that I, I already have. On the most part, there's, there's a few things in there that might not always be the case, but generally that's the way that I'll, I'm going moving forward. Only Gibson I'm looking forward to that I've seen is a flying V. I really want to get my hands on one at some point again. I used to have one back in the day. They're a really cool guitar. 
but I'm not that excited by seeing the same stuff being re-released every single year. It's just not that exciting. Sure, there's some innovations in the sort of more digital realm, I guess, and that's cool, um, but I'm, I'm not that excited by it. I, I saw some stuff pop up. I was like, hey, more strats, hey, more tallies, hey, more Les Pauls. When's enough is enough, man. Maybe I think some of these companies should only do this maybe every other year. That would give people more to look forward to. It's been two years. It's got to be great, right? So I don't know. Let me know what you think about this topic as well. I really think people get too carried away waiting on next year's stuff instead of actually practicing or playing out live or improving their their faculties on the instrument. Uh, We're all guilty of that. I'm guilty of that to some extent as well. But you get my point. I think it's just more about more about the music more about the playing than it is waiting for next year's stuff and getting behind the hype train i've seen the hype train let so many people down over the years and uh just don't buy into it just practice and play and enjoy it thanks for listening thanks for watching folks my name's shane if you're new here don't forget to subscribe and click the bell if you're watching on youtube if you want an audio version of this only head over to itunes or any of those podcasting softwares like that type it in the blues and it should come straight up you can also listen for free at inthebluespodcast.com. Cost you nothing. Click play. Good to go. Nice and simple. So a huge thanks again goes out to the Patreon subscribers as well. I touched on this earlier, talking about the gimbal. It really helps support the show, and it's fantastic, guys. So thank you so much again for the support here at In The Blues. I really appreciate it. And we got more good content coming up. And like I said, I strive to make the videos I produce better every single year or anytime I can. So any of the local Guitar Search Saturdays that we are coming up, as well as any of the annotations and stuff you see on screen, that's all through Patreon. So thank you guys, I really appreciate it. If you want to find out more about that, all the links will be on screen or in the description below as well. If you have any comments or questions or things you'd like for me to discuss on a future podcast, let me know below as well. And I will catch you all on the next one. Thanks again, guys. Catch you soon. See ya.